David Norbert, uh, is currently president of the International Center for Transitional Justice. He has a long career in international justice, most recently uh, as registrar of the UN Special Tribunal for Lebanon. Uh, and Rudy Saitel, <coughs> uh, Rudy is a pioneer in the study of transitional justice. She's professor of comparative law at the New York Law School and currently also visiting professor at LSC Global Governance. Now I would like to acknowledge from the start the generous support of the LSC Annual Fund uh, for this event and also to invite all of you to join us for a reception following the event which will take place uh, at the Atrium Gallery which is just next door uh, in the same building. And then finally before I give the floor to the speakers I would like to invite Leslie Vigilmori to introduce very briefly uh, the initiative. and I should say especially thank you to Yavor who really was um, central in making this happen both in terms of getting everything organized and conceptualizing the event and, and really thinking through who to invite which you can see we're very lucky to have the, the people that we do. I just want to say a couple of words about what the London Transitional Justice Network is. We started small about a year ago um, with a few meetings uh, in the spring of 2009 and it invites in saying that, I wanted to thank one person who I don't know if he's here tonight, Lars Waldorf, uh, who was one of the original founders as well as the three of us. Um, but he, uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately for him, unfortunately for us, then moved up to York to the Center for Applied Human Rights. But he was very much part of this initiative. Let me say a little bit about who we are and why we're a network. Um, we, tonight, is a formal launch of the network. As you know, and as Yavor mentioned, we're, we're sort of a group of organizations, I'm going to mention some of those, but run um, out of our three respective centers that Yavor's already mentioned. Uh, who's in the network right now? Um, we have more than 12 colleges and universities represented in the network. Um, and within this network, in addition to a range of advocacy organizations, in addition to universities, we have a range of advocacy organizations, foundations, think tanks, and individuals from the government. Um, amongst our academic members, we have a range of disciplines. So we have legal scholars, we have scholars from politics, from international relations, from sociology, and from other disciplines as well. Um, I think we have one anthropologist, and we encourage more. Um, our, our other organizations, let me just list a few uh, so that you're aware. We have um, several members uh, from Amnesty International. I see Chris Hall here in the front row. Very, very happy to have her tonight. Thank you. Um, we have <coughs> several from Human Rights Watch, including the director who's here tonight, Tom Burgess. Um, from the European Council on Foreign Relations, Anthony Work, we didn't know you even meant to be here. <laughs> uh, from the Sigrid Rousing Trust, the Open Society Institute, the Overseas Development Institute, Conciliar Conciliation Resources, and the Foreign Office, just to name a few. Um, why are we a network? Since we're at the LSC tonight, I, I sort of thought, well, you know, network, institute, center, uh, foundation, all these, there's lots of these organizations. Why are we a network? And Chandra and Yavor were really very clear that we are a network and not a workshop or a center or something else. So I, so I took a look at the academic literature on this, um, and I came up with three uh, maybe lessons or, or ideas for the way forward um, for networks. First of all, what's the definition of a network? One definition of a network is a collection of individuals or groups that pursue repeated and enduring exchange relations with one another and at the same time lack a legitimate organizational authority to arbitrate and resolve disputes that may arise during the exchange. <laughs> um, Anne-Marie Slaughter, who I'm sure is known, most of you, she's currently directing the policy planning staff of the State Department and is also um, ordinarily dean of the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University, has written on networks. And in her book, she argued that networks offer the general virtues of speed, flexibility, inclusiveness, and an ability to cut across jurisdictions and create a sustained focus on a specific set of Problem. So this is from her book, A New World Order, in 2004. So the first lesson that I took from this, there are many, um, but it's that we officially lack the capacity to resolve conflict, and we're unlikely to produce a consensus amongst our members. So the best way forward is robust 
pluralism. We are, not, we are more than the sum of our parts. Um, secondly, from the literature, what other potential do networks often? Um, open networks, as opposed to closed networks, and I think we aim to be an open network. Open networks with many weak ties and social connections are more likely to introduce new ideas and opportunities to their members than closed networks with many redundant ties, which eventually disintegrate into peace. Um, Mark Granovetter, the social theorist, knows many of you refer to this as the strength of weak ties. So lesson number two as a network, I think and I hope that we aim to remain open rather than close to new members, so please remind us of those people who are not currently in the network, uh, and to extend our access to new ideas. When I worked at USAID in 1992, I think this was referred to as the goal of aiming to avoid that age-old problem of reinventing the wheel so the network potentially allows us the capacity to do that. Uh, and then thirdly, on internetwork networking, um, a group of individuals, a network is a group of individuals, ideally with connections to other social worlds, and in that way is likely to have access to a wider range of information. It's better for individual success to have connections to a variety of networks. And this I think is important because I noticed that we have several individuals here from the Oxford Transitional Justice Research Group, the Essex Transitional Justice Research Group, Research Network, the Essex Transitional Justice Network, the Oxford Transitional Justice Research Group, and to mention a few others who are not actually here, the, Africa, the African Transitional Justice Research Network. We've had individuals from all these organizations who have actually actively worked with us to think through and conceptualize who we are, what we aim to do, um, and several of whom are, mem who are members. So the, the network does not seek to be necessarily closed um, in any way, shape, or form. It's very much open, I think, to, to the working with other networks. Let me say in closing, our board, um, I told you sort of who our members are, but our board is also very international and I think reflects <coughs> the ambition and goals of the network. Most of our board members were not able to be here tonight, although one is on the panel, um, because we don't have that kind of thing yet, but I just wanted to mention them by way of thanking them. Um, so our mem the members of our International Advisory Board, Christine Bell from Northern Ireland, Christine Chinkin from the LNC, Pablo de Jeff from New York, Anthony Dworkin, who is here tonight, thank you, Ambos Gaon from Israel, James Gandhi from Kenya, who some of you will know, Priscilla Hayner, known to most of you, based in Geneva now, Neil Fritz at USIP in Washington, D.C., Rama Mani from Oxford and Sri Lanka, Sarah Mendelssohn, who might have to temporarily suspend her role because she's gone into the um, current U.S. As of today. Uh, and Yasmin Louise Suka from South Africa, Rudy Heitel from New York, Abdul Tejan Cole, Sierra Leone, Lars Waldorf, now in New York, and Harvey Weinstein in California. So thank you to them and thank you to all of you for turning out tonight. I think it's the best uh, strategy if I speak uh, 
uh, about achievements and uh, about uh, results, uh, results and uh, pro problems and pro and problems. All of you know that the international community established international criminal tribunal during the war. It was in 1994. Uh, uh, Office of Prosecutors started to uh, to work, and uh, also. Uh, uh, you know that uh, many <coughs> uh, perpetrators uh, based on uh, command responsibility were uh, tried, uh, sentenced, but also you know that uh, in time uh, of armed conflict uh, uh, and uh, in time of functioning tribunal, uh, genocide is happened in uh, Srebrenica and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I wanted to say that uh, there are uh, really serious and very important uh, uh, results, uh, but also, uh, also it's very difficult to explain how uh, it was possible to, uh, uh, to have an uh, international tribunal, judges and prosecutors, and uh, genocide in the same time. What is the benefit from uh, the tribunal? Uh, we have facts uh, about what's happened uh, uh, in the past, not only facts about, uh, about the concrete crimes <coughs> and about uh, con concrete per uh, perpetrators. We have facts about, uh, facts about uh, why the crimes is happened. And for uh, the future, uh, for uh, the future generation and for, uh, 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 for uh, historians and it's very important to have facts about uh, about uh, uh, why the crimes is happened uh, in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, what is also important to uh, to mention that uh, uh, that uh, we expected that international trials will bring uh, uh, reconciliation, but uh, I think it was. Uh, to expect uh, from a uh, uh, tribunal, because the, the main duty of tribunal is to bring uh, uh, justice for the victims and perpetrators. And you know, the reconciliation process is a process uh, uh, who should be initiated by the people of uh, former Yugoslavia, and uh, uh, it, it should be their need, need to reconcile with uh, the past and <coughs> their history. And uh, uh, after the war in Kosovo in 99, uh, uh, you know, the, the domestic war crimes trial started. Of course, uh, under the pressure of the international community. But uh, uh, I think uh, it was uh, important to force uh, post Yugoslav uh, um, authorities to start with, uh, with the national trials. To, take uh, responsibility for, uh, to punish, uh, to try perpetrators, and to, to, to think uh, that the establishment of rule of law uh, depends from uh, domestic war crimes trials. Now we have everywhere in the region domestic trials, and uh, what is the main result? That uh, national authorities, uh, national prosecutors are willing to try and sentence ordinary perpetrators. It's not the same uh, if, it's big, uh, if we want to see what's happened to it, uh, individuals who are uh, responsible uh, based on command responsibility. <coughs> it's always uh, uh, difficult to see cases of uh, command responsibility because uh, many of them who, uh, who have responsibility for the war and uh, crimes uh, are still uh, institution, especially in police uh, and army. And uh, national parliaments are not so, uh, 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 are not uh, uh, institution with uh, really demo uh, democracy. Uh, they, uh, m uh, many members of uh, national parliaments uh, were the members of parliaments in time of armed conflict. And we cannot expect from them now, you know, to uh, to, uh, to, to say that, um, uh, that everything what's happened in the past uh, 
is uh, uh, their responsibility and you know to to expect from them to uh, to criticize themselves and to uh, to expose their uh, opinion to uh, to the public but uh, uh, <coughs> one thing uh, uh, is that we have uh, uh, both kinds of us but uh, uh, what uh, we don't have uh, Considering uh, official uh, approach to the to the past, there are no public institutional official debate about the, the past. We have uh, war crimes trust, but without uh, media attention, without uh, uh, without attention uh, uh, of uh, politicians. I never seen politicians who are uh, interested to come to monitor the trials to speak about the trials. For them, trials are uh, uh, important because international community uh, requires uh, uh, domestic war crimes trials. Also, they see international trials are, um, as uh, obligation uh, uh, to uh, ob obligation uh, international obligation. They don't see trials as uh, domestic uh, need uh, to uh, uh, to open issue. Uh, as a way to open issue about the past, what's happened in the past, uh, uh, who's responsible to speak about political responsibility, moral responsibility. No, for them is an uh, international obligation, and the majority of them, uh, they hope that, uh, will, uh, that uh, they will close the uh, page of the past uh, with, uh, uh, with closing uh, the international uh, tribunal uh, in the 2012. But one very important uh, uh, thing uh, happened. Uh, uh, civil society from whole region understand uh, that uh, war crimes trials are not in, uh, enough if we want to establish factual truth about the past. If we want to, uh, to create, uh, to build uh, factual record about the past. Uh, and uh, what is the best achievement and uh, the best result? Uh, uh, the best result is uh, achieved by uh, civil society in the region. <coughs> Two years ago, we started to think how to establish uh, facts about the past, how to prevent uh, politicians, uh, historians in, today, in the future to manipulate with, uh, uh, with uh, number of the victims uh, to start to, with different political interpretation about what's happened. And uh, we started to think and to uh, take some concrete uh, measures. Uh, in October 2008, we established regional coalition coalition with uh, victims association, human rights organization, uh, good organization with the main aim to establish, uh, uh, to establish model of regional co uh, commission, to organize a consultation process about uh, regional commission will deal with facts about war crimes and uh, facts about all victims and to uh, organize debate with different uh, uh, groups, uh, civil society groups, to keep issue of, uh, of past uh, alive and to make pressure on institutions in the region uh, related to the needs uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to debate about the past. And now we have uh, uh, 945 organization as members of coalition. We have uh, debate uh, uh, everywhere in the region. And uh, uh, what is, uh, what is, what is uh, 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 when a civil society debate is uh, only debate in the region about the past. Uh, it's only space for victims to speak about <coughs> their experience, about their needs, about their expectations, and uh, what is important for them. And now, uh, we came to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to agreement about uh, some issues uh, were relevant for 
for uh, uh, control process and establishment of regional commission. All members uh, uh, of commission, victims association, victims, uh, youth organization, all of them, uh, uh, they, uh, for them is uh, very important to uh, establish the facts about the Uh, until a uh, date, uh, we uh, didn't come to agreement about uh, about causes of the war. Some participants think that it is so, uh, too serious uh, issue for uh, for regional commission to uh, uh, to uh, examine uh, uh, causes of the war. And until date, uh, we think that uh, priority sh uh, should be establishment of facts about the war, about all the victims, uh, name all the victims, and to try to establish, to build a, a climate in the region based on compassion and solidarity with all, uh, all the victims. And what is also uh, important, that the victims from whole region, there are no differences between, between Serbs, Albanians, Croats, and uh, Muslims relating the issue of missing persons. You know that we have uh, more than 16,000 missing persons. And uh, uh, we have everywhere in the region uh, government or commission dealing with the missing persons. But uh, there are no development in that. And we think that the regional commission and all participants think that believe that the regional commission uh, uh, can, uh, uh, can uh, s uh, support uh, families to, uh, to and the society and official commission to discover mass graves and to support families in their effort to know what's happened with uh, their relatives. Also what is important uh, uh, to say that, uh, uh, that the participants in discussion uh, believe that, uh, uh, that all states in the region have obligation to uh, to establish factual record about the past and to uh, leave interpretation about the past to historians and the young generation in the, for, uh, in the future to deal uh, with uh, that. Now we have, uh, uh, we have everywhere discussion about the model <coughs> and uh, in the end of uh, uh, May, in the beginning of June, we'll start uh, to discuss the first uh, draft of a model. Uh, it means that uh, all participants in discussion uh, will consider a draft and to, 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 uh, to give their opinion of what they think about, for example, criteria, uh, a criteria, criteria about uh, selection and appointment of members of, uh, of a commission. It's not easy. It's easy to uh, to take a good uh, uh, solution from other uh, third commissions about criteria, but uh, there are no case of regional commission, and you know uh, it means that we need to establish or create uh, criteria who will uh, uh, help us uh, to uh, uh, elect members of commission who will be respected in whole region. It means uh, to, uh, to appoint uh, a member from Serbia who will be respected by society in Kosovo, uh, what is very difficult to see uh, how it's possible, or to, uh, to, s uh, to appoint uh, a point member, of, uh, member from Croatia who will be respected by, by whole society in Serbia. But it's difficult, but it's our uh, task and our, uh, uh, our, uh, our uh, plan is to, uh, uh, to continue to, to discuss uh, until the end of uh, this year. And uh, in the spring of uh, the next year, we'll organize campaigns for million signatures. And our plan is, uh, uh, is, uh, is going to uh, to organize uh, a special event on 1st June 2011, uh, 
uh, been submitted to all uh, governments and parliaments in the region, our model for regional commission, who will deal with all uh, with facts about all victims with the million signatures as uh, support for uh, regional commission. And later, uh, if you have any question, uh, and uh, uh, I will be uh, glad to uh, speak to you and to help. Thank you very much. There have been a number of, when we look back, there's been a great deal of development in truth-telling and, and, and criminal justice. And 
And also, the whole victims' rights revolution was, was just beginning really in the 80s with the 85 Declaration. And moving forward, we now have uh, victims actually being able to participate in international criminal court proceedings and claim reparations. Uh, these are not fully realized yet, but there's a start. And then we see in domestic, uh, uh, domestic context, So what I'm going to say about these challenges have to be seen against a, a, a backdrop of tremendous movement and accomplishment in the transitional justice field. But we do face a, a number of challenges that I would, I would make a little observation. Um, one that's pretty obvious and I think is already largely Second issue that I think that we have to think a lot about, uh, those of us who are practitioners, and I've asked to speak in my capacity as a practitioner, is the, is the issue of the demand for empirical proof of, the, uh, of our work. Uh, those, of, uh, those of us who have to raise funds and, and look to, to, to have programs, uh, donors will increasingly ask for <coughs> challenge and one that uh, obviously uh, in terms of someone who's been very involved in the international justice uh, uh, movement is the issue of complementarity in the ICC. We're now at a situation
does that ultimately connect up with the work of the ICC? How do these, how do these things work together? Because at the end of the day, if we simply have a few prosecutions in the Hague and with little, or with, without, uh, without prosecutions and, and or, or criminal processes on the ground, complementarity, which is at the, the heart and the cornerstone of the ICC, is going to deny uh, perhaps a dead letter. And without the other mechanisms, uh, or at least the other criminal law mechanisms of the AG in terms of ad hoc tribunals, domestic prosecutions would have few and far between, and we would have lost a tremendous opportunity. And that's, uh, I, I underline this, what do we do, whether complementarity, where does complementarity fit, or what does it actually mean for the court and for the whole, and for, the, for those donors and rule of law networks on the ground in those countries. Another question or issue that I think faces the field, and that is the question of transitional justice and development. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a truism that obviously transitional justice and development uh, should be overlapping and that transitional justice and development are, should work hand in hand. Uh, but uh, at this point, um, they're, they're really two different communities. They're development actors and they're transitional justice actors. And I think to some extent, it's important for those of us working in transitional justice to realize that to some extent, it's unclear to me as to what extent this is, this is uh, what the trend is, but that we've been in an era of justice, really. Justice has driven a great deal of the agenda with the, with the international <coughs> development is, at least with many, uh, with many uh, donors and with many of the uh, development agencies, is really coming to the fore and we, to some extent, may be moving to sort of a development paradigm. But there are very clear connections between transitional justice and development. I would argue, of course, that transitional justice is essential for development. But one of the things that I think we should be thinking about in, in terms of socio economic rights and cultural rights
probably use all my time on, but I wanted to put those issues out. Uh, perhaps they're not trends, but they're certainly things that are things that we need to uh, we need to uh, be considering and thinking about. <coughs> I will uh, I will say that um, closing on an optimistic note, the transitional justice is really here to stay. It's a cardinal landscape. It, a great deal. 
question. Let, let, let me just uh, uh, observe that at, at this point, because we can see that, uh, that transitional judgment has become somehow normalized and entrenched within existing legal regimes uh, and has become a part of the lexicon, both in human rights and humanitarian law, and it's also been informed by uh, those uh, regimes, um, that um, the judiciary have been brought in uh, more and more, but that it isn't the invisible hand of the law and this is another uh, research uh, project, one in which uh, Yavor and um, Marika and others at the uh, Center uh, <coughs> for Global Governance, Mary uh, Cowder, have been involved in, which is the role of civil society uh, in uh, transitional justice. And that is that uh, it's clear that even if there were uh, resources and strong states, that there are other actors with other, uh, other aims that are highly active in this sphere and have been turned into uh, legal mechanisms uh, to advance their aims and, and other non-legal as well. So uh, obviously uh, uh, the RECOM project, which Natasha talked about, uh, is one. In Latin America, uh, many of the uh, uh, highlights of universality jurisdiction and uh, of um, development of international law have been occasioned by and kept alive by civil society. So that, you know, bringing us back to the beginning, after Junta rule, Argentina has uh, uh, an extraordinary number of trials and a revival of human uh, rights related prosecutions. Um, much of this has been made by, by civil society, but, but we know that's not the full story, that there must be a dynamic uh, relationship between the state and non-state actors, and that there's a certain policies of transitional justice and a certain usefulness of this mechanism uh, by uh, uh, the various uh, um, uh, governments at this time uh, that uh, that is taking place, and that the, and it's also shaping, of course, uh, our understanding of state responsibility. So there, are, you know, the Pinochet case is another example, an illustration on the one hand of universality uh, jurisdictions, on the other, an example of um, involvement of uh, an initiation of, of victims that would happen to be extraterritorial and, and were named in Spain. So uh, 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 let me just. Uh, uh, inspired by Natasha's experience from uh, Balkan and I just wanted to ask that is it really the international politics are playing a role on transitional justice? Because what you said, uh, 
you have so many ad hoc courts going on at the Balkan, uh, simply to please the international partners. But unfortunately, in Afghanistan, there is no digest for transitional justice among the international players. And uh, this is like a big frustration for many Afghans in the country where I am coming from. We are, you really see that the human rights perpetrators are part of the power. And uh, right now, unfortunately, the negotiations with the Taliban are going on, and the Western countries are stamping okay with that. So when you talk to the people in the ground, there are no one to listen to the victims' voices. There are no one to ask what are the need of the Afghans, who, how do you want to deal with their past? In 2001, during the bomb agreement, we brought a big number of the human rights perpetrators who were engaged in massive human rights violations in Afghanistan, and they became partners of international forces and international community to fight terrorism. So what happened as a result, they came with a definition of good human rights abusers and bad human rights abusers. And this is like right now what happening by bringing the Taliban, like the misfortunate excuse that they are giving is because we have uh, already so many human rights perpetrators, it's not enough, we need to bring more. So I really want uh, one of the panelists to answer or elaborate more on this, thank you. once quite narrowly defined, it's now associated with a divergent set of practices, conflicting moral imperatives, contexts that are not even recognizably transitional, um, for instance. So we could say that the term transitional justice has little analytical precision to the extent that it's really lost its explanatory power, and I'd be interested in um, some reflections on that. I'm Misha Gavrilovic. I have followed uh, in the hate uh, the trial of Mr. Milosevic, and I have followed it from the defense point of view. In other words, I've been in touch with the defense team. Uh, my question here is the key word there, namely justice. What is it? The way that we understand justice in this country and elsewhere is that we hear out the prosecution's case, we then hear out the defense case, where the golden rule is that the defense must be given the same resources and the same time as the prosecution. And then we have independent judges and jurors making the verdict. Now here, in the last 15 years, <coughs> in the United Kingdom, I have never heard anyone speak for the defense. I have heard here, in this very hall, uh, 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 Mr. Goldstone, Judge Richard Goldstone, Chief Prosecutor, speak here. Luis Alba, Chief Prosecutor, spoke at the LSE. Uh, Richard Goldstone spoke twice at the Royal Institute for Foreign Affairs. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Carla Del Ponte's right-hand man, who is now Sir, uh, and uh, Jeffrey Nice spoke also at the LSE. So Not once have I heard the, the defense. What is your uh, question? Uh, well, my question really, and also, by the way, Natasha Kandic has helped the prosecution in the case. Once not again, not what is the question? The question really is uh, your definition of justice, because all I see now, it is prosecution justice. And prosecution justice, uh, the a dictionary definition is a lynch. It would be very nice now that you started traditional justice here in London, that you consider getting someone to speak who okay. has actually been on the defense. It would be the first time in 15 years that this has taken place Thank you in the United States. Thank you for that question. We had another question here in the middle. 
today, um, those, those records will be, they're important to the victims now, obviously, but for some transitional justice process eventually. And another example of this, another very difficult situation in Burma, for example, where today it, there doesn't look like there's going to be any transition, but there may be a transition well down the road. We're documenting those times. We've got, we're talking to the victims, getting statements, mapping the time. So there is,